Thanks very much, Alison. And hi, everyone. Great to be with you for these short, sharp lunchtime sessions. I think they're a great idea. Um, Jackie and I are both from the Pembroke Mountains, as, uh, as Alison said, and we're keen to share with you a little bit about collaboratives, a little bit about our collaborative, and hopefully share with you some ideas which you might like to think about for your practice in terms of how things you might be able to do to improve your care of COPD as well. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So COPD is really important for us in our region. Uh, when we did our needs analysis, it was the leading cause of potentially preventable hospitalisation. So that's of great concern to us for our residents, but also of great concern to our local health district in New South Wales and the Pea Blue Mountains local health district. So you can see there the, the number of people, 308 preventable, uh, prevent, potentially preventable hospital admissions per 100,000 people, which is higher than the, the state. Um, and uh, you can see that it's the third leading cause of death in our region. So significantly higher than uh, other PHNs, LHDs in New South Wales. So it was identified by us as a really important priority. So let's have the next slide, Alison. So I'm actually the chair of the board of the PHN and uh, the PHN and the LHD, we've actually had a number of joint board meetings and one of the priorities we identified was uh, COPD and we saw it as an, an opportunity to work together, something that we could only really achieve if we work together and it's one of the great um, opportunities of PHNs and LHDs that they can do some things uh, together which they won't be able to do alone. So I guess that's a bit behind the scenes if you're in frontline practice. But these sorts of priorities really do drive the sorts of programs that get done in regions, and they certainly drove us. Just go back to the previous slide, Alison, sorry. Um, just saying that it's one of the priorities, so that the boards got together and said they want to work on it, on it together, and, and, uh, and it's a joint priority. So uh, it's actually being tackled on a number of levels. We've actually used it, to, it was our first uh, health pathway and uh, we've consulted widely with a range of stakeholders and there's a number of aligned programs in the PHN looking at this and the COPD collaborative was one of the key cornerstone uh, initiatives to try and improve the care for these people. Thanks Alison, the next slide, thanks. Um, Hello. It was short, normally they run I don't know if, you, if any of you have been in the collaboratives before, I suspect many of you have. We normally used to run them with the Improvement Foundation for 12, 18 months. This one's been shorter simply because of timelines and funding. Um, we followed a very similar structure previously where we had learning, we started off with a, an orientation for interested uh, practices. We had three learning workshops and in between the learning workshops, participating practices go back and do the work of quality improvement and all the way through they submit data to, to measure the changes. Uh, they, they learn how to make changes. And if you're frustrated at, at how difficult it is to make changes in your organisations, it is difficult to make change in organisations, but there is a lot of knowledge of how to do it. And if you want to look at the Langley and Nolan model for improvement, it's a great way to ask yourself three simple improvement questions and then do these rapid improvement cycles. We were really delighted that 14 practices from across our region agreed to participate. Thanks, Alison. And that is a diagram which many of you will have seen. That's the diagram that was commonly used by the Improvement Foundation to describe collaboratives. You can see it begins with an expert reference panel. They're, they're sh that's a short, sharp thing where you get in, in the same room, you get experts, sort of academic eggheads, and you get people who are used to actually making things happen in practices. You put them in the same room and get them to talk about what, what are we aiming for? What do we want to achieve? How are we going to measure it? And then what ideas do we have that we think can make a difference? And then the participating practices enter this cycle, this wave. So they begin with an orientation where they learn about it. They collect baseline data so we know what the level is at the beginning. They go to a learning workshop to learn about the topic and learn about quality improvement. And then you can see those blue activity periods, which are a big part of the collaborative program. And then that's repeated. They come back to the second learning workshop. They go back to the practice to do activities. They come to the third learning workshop. They go back to do activities and all the way through measurement is happening and you can see the sort of timetable that we were on. It's a really clever strategy. It combines evidence through the expert reference panel with knowledge about how to make organisational improvement through the expertise in quality improvement, 
but also psychology because the practices get together in the workshops and they get a little bit competitive when they see each other's data. And we did find that, that people are interested in what others are doing and how they're going and what the comparison is. And as they report their monthly measures, they get to see those improvements. So it's, it, it's funny, the collaborative, everything's collaborative in the sense in what we do, isn't it? But it's actually a technical term, meaning a, a way of doing things with groups of, of organisations to make improvements that you might like to think about for your region um, or if you're trying to make improvements. It begins with an expert reference panel, and you can see there the picture of the people we had together. All sorts of people from the LHD, from general practice, from the ambulance, from the Lung Foundation, and, and local patients as well, plus people who know all about how to do quality improvement. And we put them in the room and said, what are we aiming for? How are we going to measure it? What ideas will make a difference? And that, that, that uh, intellectual property gets put into a handbook, which is then given to the practices and sets the course for the collaborative. So let's look at the next slide because it's got the outcomes of that expert reference panel. So these were our aims and you might like to think about how you, your practice would be going with these aims. Can you, can you even measure them? Do you know where you stand in relation to these aims? So we thought we wanted to aim that 70% of patients diagnosed with COPD uh, are on a, a GP management plan. So GP management plans, uh, most of you will know, are, are a way of coordinating the total care of a patient within the, within a practice. There are, there are a way, they are a way to drive change in care at their best that they can be used for that. And the other thing that we thought we'd do as a marker was get to 50% the proportion of patients diagnosed with COPD who have actually had spirometry recorded. That drives all sorts of change. The use of the medical record properly to record spirometry spirometry, but also developing a register of people with COPD, and then also the skills in doing spirometry. So if a practice really nails this aim, they'll be transforming all sorts of activities with regard to COPD. And you can see there some of the measures that we put in place. Those two aims, of course, we wanted to measure, but we also measured some other key things for COPD. So how many patients had had a pneumococcal vaccination recorded? And it's interesting, just recently data's come out showing pneumococcal vaccination is dropping in general in patients in Australia. How many patients have had the influenza vaccine? And, and, and how many have had their smoking status uh, assessed? We know that these three strategies will make a big difference to COPD patients in terms of whether or not they're admitted to the hospital. So they're really key things to measure and we were looking for change. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, those are the workshops we did. Um, there, we did an orientation workshop where they got an overview and key dates. We did a learning workshop one uh, where they came together at a venue uh, and we actually discussed key things like how do you engage and support your practice team? We know that su success in collaboratives is like one of the key uh, building blocks towards it is how well your practice team is engaged in what you're doing. Do they understand where you're headed? Are they on board? Are they excited by the changes you're, you're trying to achieve? And then also stuff about the register. Are you actually coding people with COPD properly? And in the second learning workshop, we talked about that systematic proactive care. So do, are you then contacting all your people with COPD? Do you know what proportion have flu vaccine? Do you have a strategy for getting them to get a flu vaccine? And then are you teaching them about, about self-management? We know that self-management is one of the most important and, and effective strategies in terms of improving the management of chronic disease. And then the third workshop is again about that coordinated and integrated care, Look at making sure that the, the patients are getting the full range of care uh, in the community for their, their problems. So that's the, some of the content that we had for our workshops. You, you'd be welcome to use that and reflect on what you're doing. So um, Jackie, you led this, you were the person who was running it. Um, and, and also you were conscious of all the support that was going for practices. So do you just want to talk a little bit about, from the PHN uh, perspective, how did you actually make this happen? Okay. So um, myself and um, another support officer here at the PHN communicated regularly with practices. Um, we assisted them with audit reports, um, assistance with implementing the model for improvement and regular feedback to support and to guide quality improvement activities. Uh, the level of support that we did give practices varied greatly from practice to practice. Um, some we visited and contacted 
weekly to fortnightly. Others um, were able to go ahead with, um, with limited support. So it was really based on their needs that we supported them. Um, practices were also given clinical guidance and support from our wonderful WAVE Chair um, who provided feedback on progress, um, answered questions and provided encouragement to practice. Um, it was fantastic to have Andrew as WAVE Chair for the collaborative and we're extremely grateful for the time that he has given um, sharing his knowledge on quality improvement as well as clinical expertise. Uh, finally, to design and deliver the COBD collaborative, we worked uh, with the Improvement Foundation um, and very closely with our consultant, Katie Smith, who not only coached myself and the other support officers in improvement in, in sorry, collaborative methodology, um, but worked really closely with us to facilitate the expert reference panel. Uh, to write the handbook, to facilitate the learning workshops and to provide ongoing assistance and the work um, that Katie has put into this project um, is directly reflected, um, directly reflected the success that the practices have been able to achieve. She's been fantastic. Uh, so that is the support. Thank you very much. So, so Jackie, I mean, yes. the key, the, this part of it is really key. The mm -hmm. actual, it, it gives the PHN the opportunity to get into the practice to actually work with yep. nurses and GPs and practice managers. Mm -hmm. How did you organise that? Did you have people who were specifically working on the collaborative or did you use uh, the usual practice support officers and, and sort of get their skills? How did you approach it? Um, it really differed um, based on the practice and where they had, um, what they were after. Some of the practices worked very closely with the practice support team, so we would um, go in with them on many occasions and support whatever assistance they were giving to the practice already. Uh, some of them we went in alone, were backed up by practice support if necessary. Um, it, it really did come down to the practice and what they needed. We were very aware that there isn't a one-size-fits-all process to this um, and for some of them us coming around and doing face-to-face -face visits was the most appropriate option. For others, um, I mean the, the geographical distance to get out to some of our, our practices was is quite far so phone and, um, and emails work better for them to be able to make, to get the feedback and to make the improvements. Um, some of them did want um, quite a close support, we worked on them in um, supporting them with their model for improvement and their PDSA cycles, whereas others were happy to, to get the reports from us to do the PDSA cycles and to get the feedback. So really it was very much a case by case basis um, and it was something that I know the reports and the data that we were able to give them helped them immensely to, to identify those areas for improvement. Mm -hmm. And yeah. also at the learning workshops as well, I think that was a big key in terms of identifying what had worked well and the strategies for the other practices and they were able to take that back and to um, adapt those um, to their practices and implement and trial and test changes. In, in this game there's always some practices that just go, go ahead really quickly and then there's others. Yes. That, you know, did you have a sense of what, what was made the difference? Were there, there some factors that you saw that really helped practices to make change? It was really interesting because some practice we thought we're, we're going to have leaders here and some practice we were like, oh, okay. But that, as you said, practices surprised us and um, it really, um, it was, it was, I think, the creativity that some of them came up with, that some of them had in terms of ideas that they wanted to test. Um, it, it was just incredible watching them go ahead and, and to see what worked and then having, having those as ideas to lead into to further um, PDSA cycles to, to trial and test change. Um, I, it was just incredible watching what they were able to do and, I, and definitely the data was key to, um, to them being able to make and identify those changes. Why was the data key? What did the data do? Well, the, the data first of all told them, it, it told them their starting point where they were and that, that was a big point for us not to tell them, I don't, it's, uh, some of them got, got quite disappointed I think when we showed the, the baseline um, data but we said no, no, this is very exciting, this is great, it gives us a really good starting point. Yeah. Um, it then, <laughs> it's true and then we were able to identify what they, help them to identify, some of them were able to do it on their own but where they need to go. So a key thing and when we look at the results you'll see, um, in terms of, first of all, it's clearing up their patient data, so archiving patients, um, if there are any patients no longer at the, at the practice anymore, um, uh, um, archiving those, and then um, looking at those patients who may not have been diagnosed um, with COPD, um, and then 
moving as the collaborative progress more into the management stage. So having their data, and, and like you said, it comes back to the competitive nature as well of the practices. I think when we showed overall where they were compared to um, the average of the collaborative was very exciting and did spur them on, particularly in the last months of the collaborative. Yeah, look, it was our, our experience in those, over the 10 years of running the collaboratives is it was you couldn't predict how practices were going to do. Some that you thought seemed to be so have it all didn't make so much progress and others just totally surprise you and it's partly personalities I think it's partly team dynamics really interesting all right maybe we better move on oh I will ask you about the improvement foundation what I mean we you know I know the improvement foundation is running this but <laughs> what um what did what did you I know Katie's online actually <laughs> what did you what bits did the improvement foundation give you from your perspective uh, the Improvement Foundation were fundamental to um, definitely to me to coming into this project and being able to run it effectively. Um, it was just from from the start, um, the background in collaborative methodology that, that Katie, Katie came out and coached myself and other key members that were involved in the collaborative. Um, and without that, you, you do need that fundamental understanding. Without that, um, I, you, I just don't believe you'd be able to run it in the way that we were. Um, and then particularly in terms of facilitation of the expert reference panel and the learning workshops, just making sure that we covered the key change principles for those. And finally, the ongoing support. It was a, it was really good to have someone to have yourself and, to Katie, and Katie to, to debrief with on a regular basis, um, to be able to, to discuss um, any issues that had arisen, as well as to say, look, we have a practice that's um, had these particular things come up, what has worked well in other collaboratives that you found um, and be able to feed that back to practices. So a sound, having a sounding board throughout the collaborative was really, really good. Yeah. And I have to say, if you're going to run a collaborative, you need someone like Jackie or Maha around. Who, it took me ages, like years, to get my head around collaboratives, but you, you certainly caught up quickly. So that slide that you got in front of you there just shows that we had practices distributed right across the LGAs that our PHN covers, which means that we were very geographically distributed. So we actually ran workshops in different regions and uh, gave the facility to the practices to ring in. But uh, amazingly, most of them did come in person, and that I think that's really important that they're there in the room talking to each other and presenting to each other, especially in that third workshop, they presented to each other and learnt a lot from each other. Let's have the next slide. We're just going to run through some of the results with you, some of the measures. So this is interesting, the COPD population. Um, as you can see at the beginning, when we're collecting data in September, we didn't have quite so many um, people actually in the collaboratives. That's because it took us a little while to get the data out of the practices, but as practices increasingly came on board and we got the mechanisms working for collecting data, we got up to that steady state and then it stayed pretty steady. So that's just an idea of the number of patients that were involved. So 20,000 COPD patients, oh, no, not that many, but 20,000 patients involved, so it was great. So this is um, the percentage with COPD recorded. So you can see at the beginning, it was a little bit higher at 20 percent. We got up to 33 percent. So over that relatively short period of time, these practices managed to get COP, uh, the spirometry recorded for these patients. Really, a big increase. Like I think 17 percent is probably about accurate because you'll you'll remember that not many patients were actually there in that first uh, in that first month. So they basically doubled uh, the percentage, which is a huge achievement in a short time. If you think about what they've got to do, they've got to make sure those patients are properly coded. They need to know how to do spirometry and do the spirometry. And if they do do the spirometry, they've got to enter it into the right place in the clinical record so it can be um, extracted and, and shown in the data that's extracted from their clinical software. So we, we reckon that indicates a huge change, not necessarily improved care, and we say this over and over again in the collaboratives, what it does mean is that they've definitely improved their data and their recording and probably their care. And it's all improvement. You cannot improve things until you're measuring, until you know who your COPD patients are, until you know how to do spirometry and you know how to record it. So we reckon that represents really good improvement for this cohort. Thanks, let's move on to the next slide. So this is the percentage of patients with a G GP management plan. So this is the real uh, nuts and bolts of changing management with patients. You'll see that 65% of September, but remember we had a very small patient population actually uh, getting the data in 
in that first month. So we reckon that 53% probably was our baseline and they managed to get it up to 57%. May not seem like much, but I can tell you that's hundreds of, of, of uh, patients uh, having a GP management plan done and recorded. So that's really does represent a lot of work from the practices. And some practices made huge changes, others made not so much changes, and that's the, the composite change across all of the, all of the collaborative uh, practices. So let's look at the next one. So this is pneumococcal vaccination. Again, we reckon they've gone from the 32% up to the 36%. Again, that represents an enormous amount of work of different strategies that practices used to get that pneumococcal vaccination uh, into the, those patients with COPD. We know, it's a, we know pneumonia is a major cause of, of presentation to hospital and of really poor outcomes of people with COPD. So those people are now protected who weren't protected before. Uh, to get that 4% rise over that relatively short period of time, uh, just nine months, we, we see that as a really significant improvement. What's next? Oh, did we take, I thought there were some other things there, Jackie, like smoking and flu vaccine. Did we take all them out? Uh, I've only put the results in for the first three, but I can include those as um, other ones and send yeah. them through. That's absolutely fine. That's okay. Um, the practices also did manage to increase the um, smoking recordedness quite remarkably. And again, that, that was a huge achieve, achievement. Uh, I think with smoking recorders and flu vaccines, there were some good improvements there. So overall, we, we felt really positive about the, um, the changes that were made. Um, so, but we thought it was a good opportunity. I think some of you are from practices, you're wondering, well, what did they actually do to make some of the changes that brought about the improvements? Um, so I thought, Jackie, you, you dealt so closely with the practices that you actually heard what they're doing. I know uh, we've read all the um, rapid improvement cycles or PDSA cycles that people did. Um, perhaps you could just highlight, maybe start off with that team collaboration one. What sorts of actual practical things did the practices do to improve their team health to really make change? Um, look, I put this at the top because it was fundamental. Any practice that went ahead and was able to make significant change definitely worked as a team, recognising that it does take people, um, all staff at the practice to do this. Um, they were able to do this in different ways. I, the predominant one was getting together, usually at, at at staff at practice meetings um, to, to talk to each other um, and then when a new change idea was being implemented to have that communicated throughout the team so everyone was on the same page um, as there was so many ideas that were trialled that required everyone to to come on board. Um, that just underpins or basically all of the, the ideas that, f that flow out of it really. It was just so important, so exciting to see when it really did happen um, that the more coming together. And of course doing that sort of stuff um, empowers people to do other things. If you've got a team functional, they can transfer their improvement to other topics. Absolutely, and and they did some some of the practices did went ahead and did some really creative and exciting things. Um, the second one there, the lung function checklist. Um, one of our practices um, went ahead and developed a checklist to streamline the process for diagnosing and managing patients who have COPD. Prior to doing that, it was very much um, based on how the GP or individual GPs went about it. Um, there was no one set process, um, but the practice nurse who was very involved in the collaborative as well as um, a few of the GPs came together to develop this streamline process and it is quite a, a, a succinct document but it, it does just give that, um, that, that continuous level of care that all the GPs are now following which is really exciting. Another one that the when another practice came in was um, the idea of referring patients directly from their appointment with the GP um, either through a recall that it, they'd been sent out to come in um, and have spirometry straight in to see the nurse to get the pneumococcal vaccination so they didn't have to come in more than once and we saw that there um, the number of patients who did have the pneumococcal vaccination go up significantly when they tried. It was really exciting for us to go back and actually be able to show them through the audit report that their what they had trialled had worked um, and, and to, to pat them on the back and to, to encourage them to share that with the other practices in the collaborative. Um, another practice um, was very generous in um, um, giving time to the practice nurse to update clinical software records. Um, they get them two hours a week, which again, it was when we were able to go 
back to the practice and to show the difference that it had made both in, cl in cleaning up data, in the number of recalls that had been made, um, that they could see that there was value in that. So that was really exciting as well. That's a few it's of them. I'm, I'm it's something we've identified in the collaboratives that that protected time to actually do this work uh, is really valuable in terms of changing your results. But also in many chronic diseases, it actually improves the bottom line because if you actually are, are doing GP management plans in a coordinated way, making sure that you, you, your patients actually get them, uh, of course, a GP management plan is relatively well remunerated and it's also good care for the patients. Spirometry doesn't pay much. I notice they're doubling the rebate I, I read in Ausdoc. So suddenly uh, spirometry may become viable for practices to do um, and, so, uh, and, and closer to the time that you actually have to invest to do <laughs> spirometry. Um, yeah, so one of the really important things was the inhaler device technique uh, and certainly getting the lung foundation in and getting some uh, advice about how to really improve care uh, that was really valuable for the practices to realise that the simple fundamental things, a bit like reviewing and how the technique with patients was really important. Um, is there anything else that you want to highlight as things that you thought was particularly interesting or different or, or exciting from your perspective, Jackie? Oh, look, overall, um, all of the ideas um, on on that screen, it, they, they worked for particular practices. It was just so exciting to see them when something works. So seeing them go through maybe a few signs, they'd gone and they'd tried to recall patients and it, it hadn't worked, but then being able to find um, through a number of PDSA cycles the right methods. So say, for example, some of them had been sending out letters and they just hadn't worked and then mm. changed to phone calls. And then being able to see the difference on a on the audit reports, it, it, it just it made a lot of um it it meant a lot. So giving that regular um, feedback to the practices was so important um, to help them in making the change. So data was key, staying in contact regularly to see if they needed support was key, the training was key, um, both the learning workshops as well as the additional training, the spirometry and the inhaler device technique. Um, and overall, and particularly the learning workshops, which gave them the opportunity to come together and to learn from each other. Because no matter what what, what we tell them, if they can see that it's come from another practice that works, it, it's just so powerful. Um, so having that time together to chat was, was really important. Yeah, the last workshop, we actually had people from uh, practices dis um, telling us about what they'd done. I think one key thing was the um, a real key leader in each practice. So like you'd see a practice mm. manager or a practice nurse who really took this on board and got excited by it. And they really added the energy to the practice. We've got a question from Philippa as, as to where we've, we've actually seen any decrease in potentially preventable hospitalizations. Uh, we didn't even measure it, Philippa. It's really hard to measure. You need to have linked data if you think about it. You need to identify the people who are in um, general practice as they go into hospital and actually measure the change in their, their hospital presentations. It's the goal and uh, we would love to have that data. I think this sort of work, it's going to take uh, a couple of years of work before we start to see changes. But we do know that the things we're doing the evidence tells us that if you do immunise people more against pneumococcus or against influenza, that you will actually prevent their, their admission to hospitals. So, you know, it's not the ideal outcome, it's a secondary outcome, but there is a strong association between the outcomes we achieved and decrease in potentially uh, preventable hospitalisations. And Irene's asked whether the resources from the podcast, from this um, uh, webinar will be available. And, and yes, they will be, I'm sure. We've, we've said that we're very happy for the slides to be shared and so you'll have access to that. Um, we've just about used our time. I wonder if there's any, if there is one last question, if you want to throw it up on that, uh, on that uh, uh, chat pane or otherwise. Gee, Jackie, that went quick, didn't it? We've um, just about used our half hour of our lightning lunch. It, it sure did. Uh, I, I feel like we could talk about the collaborative all day. We're um, very, very proud of what the practices have been able to achieve. It's been really exciting. Good question about did we use health pathways in the collaborative? The answer is no. The health pathway is being worked on. Uh, it was a fantastic exercise for our, our region, but it wasn't up and I don't think it was actually live uh, until quite late in the collaborative, Jackie, was it? That's correct. And the COPD pathway is still in development. Um, so it should be live hopefully in the, in the coming months. Um, I've, told everyone that we they will get let them know when it does come um, when it is available to look at.
Yep. There's a question about the the uh, content of workshops one, two, and three. We haven't actually made that available at the moment, but Jackie, I don't think we'd have any problem with sharing an agenda so that people could see the sorts of things that we covered at least. I, I have no problem with that, and I'm happy to pass that on to the Improvement Foundation. The question about pulmonary rehab programs, we certainly use that. That's a, a very there's strong evidence that uh, participation in pulmonary rehab makes a difference, and we promoted it as part of the collaborative. And actually, we have now commissioned some pulmonary rehab <laughs> where it wasn't. One of, one of the things that came out of this whole process is we realised one part of our region did not have good access to pulmonary rehab. We've actually now, as a as a, as a PHN, I think, Jackie, I'm right in saying we've commissioned some pulmonary, uh, it was an exercise program in one of the regions. Uh, lungs in action. Mm. So uh, yeah. out, in, out in Windsor. So we have um, pulmonary rehab that operate out of two of our hospitals in the region. And then um, do, uh, we, we commissioned a lungs in action, so the community-based exercise program out at um, Hawkesbury Hospital, um, which is very exciting. Mm. And it's been running for a couple of weeks now. So you can see it's part of an overall regional strategy. I think I'd better hand back to Alison Konacek. You guys probably want to go and get some lunch or else go and do some work. But Alison, do you want to just finish us off? Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'd certainly like to thank Andrew and also Jackie for taking time out today um, to share with us um, what results and what's happened as part of the COP project that, or collaborative you ran. Um, just to let everyone know that the next webinar for June will be hearing from Headspace. Um, look out for registration link and more information in the upcoming newsletter. And as we close the session today, we'll get an evaluation come up. If, can I ask you to complete that um, so we can provide Andrew and Jackie with a bit of feedback of actually what you thought of the, of the webinar today. And there were a few more questions that came through the chat pane. If we haven't got um, to them all, we'll certainly um, get some information out to you where needed. And I will send out a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. And as Jackie has said that she's happy to share the agenda, they'll come out um, later this week or early next week. So again, Jackie, Andrew, thank you very much for um, taking time out to run the webinar today. It's been very informative. And everyone that's online, thank you very much for joining us and have a great afternoon.